Welcome to Mapping the Self. I'm Selena Garofino. Know thyself was carved into stone at the entrance of Apollo's temple at Delphi in ancient Greece. Scholars, poets, philosophers have debated the big questions around what it is to know yourself for thousands of years. I invite you to join me for conversations with artists, creators, scholars, spiritual teachers, writers, and humans of all walks of life to discuss these big questions together, to engage in a dialogue around what it is to live fully, to map ourselves, to know ourselves, to grow our compassion and listening, and to explore together our highest possibilities. Welcome. I am here with someone I'm so honored to call my teacher and a friend. She is a constant source of inspiration, a speaker, a poet of the highest order. She's an incredible artist and creator, a best-selling author, a mother not only to her own son, but to so many of us. And she is the one to whom I look anytime I need a real example of grace and compassion and elegance. She is an elder and a luminary to our generation. I'm so honored to welcome Miss Elena Brower to the very first episode of Mapping the Self. Oh my gosh. That's the first time I was actually called an elder and I am so, my whole body is tingling from it. Thank you. Mine is too. I actually have a little tear in my eye. I think I it's same. so true. I have it. It's like stuck in my throat. Totally. Yeah. And you're Thank the person you. who has inspired me to recognize that it's my job to become one. Mm. And I think about it every time. I'm crying already. I think about it every time I walk in oh to God. teach now. Yes. I'm like, I have to be an elder. I have to practice being an ancestor. It has to start now. Mm. Wow. Well, I, I guess this podcast is done. <laughs> End episode. <laughs> Scene. <laughs> Oh, bless. It's nice to be here with you. It truly is. I'm going to start off by asking you a simple, not simple question. What is self-mastery to you? And I know it's, I say it's simple, not simple, because I think there's a really pragmatic, practical piece of mastery and what the self is. And then there's like the big esoteric dialogue, right? Do you know what's really weird? I, I, I'm slightly obsessed with um, Ryan Holiday's Daily Stoic book. Mm. And a recent one had to do with the Marcus Aurelius quote from his meditations. I think it's 2.2. And I only remember the number because 22 is one of my numbers. It was something like this, that you have to frame your thoughts as though you were a very old person and not let yourself be enslaved by this thought, this pattern, this habit, no longer kind of being tugged in every direction by every impulse. Um, it had an element of no complaining <laughs> about mm-hmm. your present fortune or dreading the future. I think all of those fall under the auspices of self-mastery. Uh, and and there's more, but that's that's one of them. And I think all the teachings of the Stoics really for some reason, didn't land on me until very, very recently this year, you know, 2021, 2022, but feels very relevant to me right now. Like, hey, you can't control anything. And so the best thing you can do is actually orient yourself toward everything changing all the time. Mm, this is so weird. I So I have studied philosophy in my undergrad. And mm-hmm. I just recently, I just said to someone yesterday, we need more people studying stoicism right now. And I pulled out old notes from from philosophy class and Jeff and I also spoke about stoicism and how relevant it is right now. He actually has a course on stoicism. Of course he does. I know. Of course he does. So it's so funny you brought this up. Oh, I love that man. Um, I, yeah, I I don't know why. Well, I do know why. I I just wasn't ready for it. But now, now it makes perfect sense to me. The, all the teachings of the Stoics and the 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 under underlying thread, which is you can't control anything except for your own attitude. Yes, and separate yourself a little bit from the emotionality of your opinions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And which is so similar to what you spoke about on retreat recently, like the stepping in Zen Buddhist meditation of stepping just a little askance 
a little yes. off to the side. Yes. And I've been thinking about that a lot. I have likened it to my students to what boxers do. Because when someone's throwing a punch at you, you have to cut the angle, which is right. to step off to the side so you don't get smashed in the face. Yes. And so when something's coming at you and there's an intensity and an emotionality to it, I'm like, you just have to cut the angle so mm. you can see it and you can get it from another perspective. Mm. Wow. I love learning about that sort of stuff from you. It's an interesting know. thing. I never would have thought if you would have told me years ago that I would spend so much time on mats, you know, sparring and fighting people. I would have been against it too, 10 years ago. I would have mm. been like, that's violence. That's, you know what I mean? I would have had a lot to say about it 10 years ago. Well, it does dawn on me that there is an element of of very healthy kind of release of tension and bursts of movement. These are all indicated in uh, healthy aging, healthy hormones as we age. Mm -hmm. So uh, it makes perfect sense to me. Well, and it's so complex and complexity deeply nourishes us. Like we like to simplify things because life is scary and confusing and all of these things, you know, and if we Mm -hmm. can reduce Mm -hmm. complex problems to something simple, we feel safe but yes. it's a, it's an illusion of safety yes. and complexity deeply nourishes us, our brains, our tissues. Yes. And Brazilian jiu-jitsu, for example, is the most complex thing. I, one of the most complex things I've encountered. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. a like multi-level chessboard and mm-hmm. it's very stimulating to my neurology. Uh, one of the black belts I train with always says that it's not the strong people that are problematic for him. It's the intelligent ones. Dude. I, I can't really improve upon that, but I can echo the first part of it, which is in the, I just did winter practice period at Upaya mm. Zen Center, and in, we studied the song of the Jewel Mirror Samadhi, old, old, old uh, text. And one of the, my favorite couplet by far in the whole reading, it's like two full pages, complications are auspicious, do not mm. resist them. <laughs> Oh, say that one more time for the people in the back. (laughs) For the people in the back, complications are auspicious. Do not resist them. And the podcast is done again. (laughs) Mm, mm, mm. Done. It's just, that feels so important to me and it has proven itself out every time, any time since I started to play with it. You know, I can just say an email that came in regarding a project that I'm on. It's a complete sideways, you know, tangent and really could throw somebody off. James was listening to me handle the wording of my response on the phone with my colleague. And I got off the phone. He was like, wow, you just like completely breezed through that. That could have really thrown me for a major loop for days. You know, people are trying to strong arm me, whatever. It's no, just no big deal. Change is constant. My attitude is the only thing I can control. And I said, you know, it's so funny. I Complications are auspicious. And it taught me how to just take line by line, respond in a way that feels true to me. And remember that, like, you know, everybody's going to have to compromise at some point. Everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to go the way it's meant to. And onward. Yes, that's so good. Well, and because we can't, I was listening to Rick Roll interviewing uh, Lisa Miller, I believe her name is, um, about the awakened brain. And they were talking about how, what happens when we get overly focused in one direction because things are supposed to go a certain way is we get top down attention, like dorsal ventral vision. Yes, yes. And things get very narrow. And he used the example of you start trying to move the only chess piece that won't move on the board. But that when you broaden your awareness and take a step back, you get bottom up vision and things get very spacious and you can see the yellow door and that that's where all the like possibilities are. And I know this is so true from my own life when I reflect back every time I kept hammering at something, you know, this person's supposed to love me or I'm supposed to have that job. You know, everything gets so narrow and constricted and painful 
and all of the good things that have come happened, the redemptive things happened when I let go a little bit and gave it some space and opened up the aperture of the mind again. You know, I'm in the middle of writing a parenting course. It's been 15 years in the making. And a section at the end is sort of a bonus module, but it's really like included in the course, is all about uh, shame and how the book is called Biology of Transcendence. And there's a whole section in there, doctor by the name of Alan, a researcher by the name of Alan, A-L-L-A-N, Shore, S-C-H-O-R-E. And he talks about the fact that shame stress for a child causes that exact result in the brain. It closes down all the neurology related to imaginative, creative thinking, and actually enhances the neurology of instinct, animal, survival, um, nowhere near thriving. Mm. And uh, to just kind of highlight what you've just said, there's a lot of wisdom in prioritizing the uh, enhancement of the neurology and the creative imaginative um, aspect of the brain function to, it changes us all. Like if one of us does that in a room, in a space, in a group, in a family, if one of us prioritizes that spacious, open-end thinking, everyone else is impacted in some way, even if they resist it. Yes. So interesting. That's so, a couple of things. One, I'm thrilled you're writing a parenting book. I'm not a parent, but I've witnessed your evolution with Jonah because you have always chosen to evolve publicly, which is a gift to all of us. And Sometimes. Yeah. I, <laughs> Mostly. I, yeah. I mean, I, I know you. I think it's helpful because it's really easy to see people of grace and elegance and think that it's always that way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you've been really honest about processing anger and learning how to be more spacious with your kid. And even people like me that are not parents, I still learn from that. Yeah. You know, I there was a lot of volatility in my household. My parents were very young. And that was my blueprint. You know, yeah. and for the first part of Jonah's life, basically until I got sober when he was about eight. Um, yeah, there are tons of situations f- about which I am not proud at all, like at all. And, but he and I have worked through all of those. We talk still about some of those times when he was small and how, you know, I'm still sorry. And I still remember the feeling of, shame within myself about some of my behaviors. And the one thing I did do, I followed the instructions in uh, in that book, The Biology of Transcendence. I would always apologize right away if I shamed him unnecessarily. Well, any shame is unnecessary. Anytime I shamed him, I would quickly move in the direction of an apology. Yeah. And that that, according to this researcher, Uh, Alan Shore, that would rewire the brain toward that more open, spacious, less limbic, more creative, more imaginative uh, thinking and being. Mm. And I could feel it. You know, it it was a hug. It was a, a genuine acknowledgement of the wrong that I had done in words and in feeling. Uh, it was asking questions of him. How did that make you feel? So it could really, really land and I could really respect and receive the damage that I had done mm. and then move on from it. We didn't hang out in those spaces for too long, but I, I hung out long enough so that he could feel complete and seen in his pain. And That's I, so good. Yeah, I I know that it's I know that it's the right thing. I know that we're good now. That's the right thing in any conversation, right? Any relationship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And it sets the I heard a definition of forgiveness once and I don't remember who said it, but it meant to give as before. Ooh, I've never heard that. Yeah. Wow. I think it was Alison Armstrong. I always like to give credit where it's due. 
I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure it was Alison Armstrong, but she said, it's not just setting the bar, it's to give as before. Wow. Right? I mean, that's profound. To yeah. give as before. Forgive as before. My gosh. And I love what you're saying about the limbic brain. And one of the ways we talk about that in the personal development coaching we do is your lizard brain and your wizard brain when we're talking mm. to children about it. I've never heard wizard said. Lizard, yeah, wizard. Lizard, That's wizard, genius. right? Um, Dr. Ronnie Straub, a friend of mine, she's a child psychologist, uh, came up with that terminology. And it's how she speaks with children. She right. raised 27 children. Um, oh out of the prison and foster system and four of her wow. own biological children Wow! in Canada in a tiny town. Wow. And she spent years working with like violent criminals in prison and their children. And she came up with that terminology of lizard brain, wizard brain. Mm. And it's cool because now, like when we're talking about lizard brain, how do you know you're in your, li- your lizard brain? That tension that starts rising in the body. Yes. You know, the tension in the chest or um, that kind of silly glee where it's not, it's like an erratic kind of manic glee. Manic, yeah. Yeah. And the more I start to identify those lizard responses, it gives me the opportunity to pause and tap into human spirit, which is the wizard. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Seriously, incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It's so nice to have words for things. You and I are the same in this regard. Yes. Like, please let me have words and study the thing and, you know, know what it means. It's so funny. We're we're such dorks like that. Well, you complexity requires a Mm -hmm. lot of ways Mm -hmm. of understanding things. It's why I found such a home in Katoni Yoga because of the endless metaphor and the way I get to turn things over and say it seven ways and put it in a myth and a mm-hmm. metaphor that is impersonal and has something more up for grabs than mere truth, which can be cruel. Yes. But to put it in story in a way that it can land with everyone because it's it's not about them specifically. It's something that we all share. Mm. I love That's the gift of language. Yeah. Yeah. It is a gift of language. Yeah. So I'm going to switch gears a tiny bit and ask you about altruism and the direct line between our own well-being and the well-being of others. That of is a quote from your interview with Jeff Krasno, mm. our mutual friend. And I was in tears listening to that episode. Yeah. Just sobbing in my truck, could not get out of the car. It's freezing outside like nine below zero. And I was sitting in my truck because I couldn't stop the episode when you were speaking about Micah out at the BLM protests and the woman choosing to recognize and see her. I was just weeping in my truck, but you both- Breathtaking. Breathtaking. If you haven't listened to this episode, you must go. It's on the Practice You podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, Give a listen. It's 30 minutes of your time that will nurture you and stimulate your thinking for a long time. Mm -hmm. But you made, you know, the two of you were speaking about how we can no longer- have a well-being, a personal practice that is only about us and that it has to extend to the well-being of others. And you guys touched on a lot of that, so I won't you know, reiterate what was already said there, but I would just yeah. love to have you speak a bit about altruism and personal practice. What's weird is that <coughs> this is the <coughs> month in the mentorship uh, on service. And so... I got into Roshi Joan Halifax's book, Standing at the Edge, because the first edge state that she addresses of the five is altruism. Mm -hmm. The word, it turns out, was coined in 1830 by a French philosopher, Auguste Comte, C-O-M-T-E. And he got it from the expression en français, vivre pour autrui, which is to live for others. And an antidote, Roshi Joan says, an antidote to the selfishness of living for ourselves, it became kind of a doctrine socially rather than something that was religious. It was based on humanism. And detached from dogma, it becomes kind of a a code for people who don't necessarily believe in God. I don't have a particular, you know, care either way, whatever you believe, if you're listening. 
But the people who act from the purest form, the high edge of altruism, they're not looking for approval. They're not looking for, you know, recognition. If Roshi Joan uses this example, a woman sees a child running into an intersection and she doesn't think, well, saving this child's going to make me a great person. It's going to make me look good. She goes into the road. She grabs the kid and puts her own life at risk to save the life of the kid. Mm -hmm. She doesn't praise herself after. That was just exactly what, you know, one would do. That's the high uh, edge of altruism. There are many, many stories of it. Um, And that's kind of, it's kind of where we land when we have the practice of prioritizing our own well-being. Because we're able to have that very um, open, spacious, creative thinking. And we naturally um, migrate within ourselves toward acts of genuine altruism without needing recognition, mm. being invisible and, pl- you know, hiding in plain sight, quietly yes. practicing. Yeah. That's really good. I just started that book. I've been it's reading really, them in the really order important. that you told me to. So I just started that one. Yeah, I think it's really important. That one is like a... You know, I wish I could get it into the hands of every eighth grade kid mm. standing at the edge in the world, not just in this country, although please in this country, but in the world. If every kid does it, it, it there's no there's no particular leaning in this book, but it takes us through these edge states, altruism, empathy, respect, compassion. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on the last one. In any case, it's just an incredible read standing at the edge. You also just, um, I I think it was your, I'm in the middle of listening to your most recent episode with the the doctor that. um, Dan Siegel. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm, So I don't, mm -hmm. I haven't finished it yet, but. My hero. Yes. I'm excited to go order his books now as well. Um, But he was talking about how our brains are designed for mapping and mapping ourselves and then yes. mapping others, which is the empathy. And I'm just seeing a direct correlation. I haven't even finished listening to the episode, but a real mm. correlation between what you're speaking of now and what he was speaking about. Well, that's that's Katona yoga, exactly. Exactly, I know. That's what I told my students yesterday in my Katona class. I was like, this is mm-hmm. why we do this, because you're designed so to hard when he said that. I did too. I was in my truck and I just started cracking up. I was driving um, to the studio to teach Katona Yoga and to teach a class on mapping and I was laughing. Anyway, it's the name of your podcast. It is because of that, because that's what it's all about. And it's so funny because when I was younger, I had a real, I was very turned off by maps. I was Mm. like, I'm a wanderer and, you know, I don't understand that. It's too complex, you know, and now I can't get enough of it, maps and numbers and Um, These things that insulate our neurology. Totally. Totally. I'm I'm really, really so happy that you came up with that name for your work. It's so apt, so perfect for you. Thank you. Yeah. I've been so appreciative of this conversation you've brought up about Mm -hmm. altruism. I mean, I've thought about that most of my life. I grew up in you know, a church that was very centered around genuine altruism and kindness and caring for others. And I watched my parents um, Mm -hmm. do that my entire life. There was always people staying in our house that were in need of a home. (sighs) And there was always food going out. And my mom is still that way. You know, Mm. so-and-so has cancer. I need to bring meals to them. So, you know, that's just the way she operates. And it's, so I really grew up with that modeled for me. Yes. But I've felt a bit of actually a strain, a pull, a paradox, if you will, in recent years, because what the church said to me was that people doing some of these more um, quotation marks, new age practices, all they talk about is themselves. It's my practice. It's my thing. I'm doing this for myself. It's about my truth. And, you know, and I think there's an element where they're not wrong. I see that a lot in our modern spaces of a very self-focused practice. And I'm not being critical of anyone but myself, but I've seen this, you know, I see it in conversation. And when I was on retreat with you and you were speaking about how our internal state and our ability to be spacious 
sets up the conditions for our highest altruism and listening and compassion, Mm -hmm. it bridged something for me. And I don't, I think both things are true. I, I agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah, you have, you have a really nice way of um, saying things. I wish I could just take your damn class. <laughs> <laughs> I will send you a recording one day. I would love oh to have God. you take any, my any class. class. I'd be so really honored. <laughs> Please, just send it to me. I would love to take it. It'd be I'm, so nice I mostly for me. teach older, my silvered foxes, I call them. I mostly That's teach silver foxes. So I'm a silver damn yes, fox. You'll be right in there. <laughs> Come on. Bring I know it, it's so funny. It. I taught such fiery classes most of my life. And now I spend my mornings with women in their seventies and I love it so much. You know what? You're a smart, you're a smart cookie, as my mother would say. That's yeah. a really wise way to spend your time. Oh, they're so wonderful. Those are the people so with wonderful. all the wisdom. They are, and these are this particular group of women that I'm so honored to be with and teach every day are women that are so curious and interested. Yes. Like they, yes. a bunch of them just took my Katona breathwork training. They had never done breathwork before. They're like mm-hmm. studying the philosophy and the material and keeping their vision yeah. open. And it's so wonderful because, you know, we used to believe this myth that, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And now we know that we stay neuroplastic our entire lives. I read a line in um, the author of The Overstory has a new book out and there's this line in it where he says- Richard Powers? Richard Powers. Oh my gosh, you have to read this book, Bewilderment. It's, what? it's, I'm weeping in the bathtub every night. Oh my gosh. It's, in, it's, it's I'm better. It's, it right now. Yeah, it's phenomenal. I had it on your retreat and I didn't end up reading it while I was there. Uh, and now I've been reading it in the bathtub every night. It's my quiet time. Oh my time. God. It's a novel. Oh, it's fantastic. I'm so excited. There's a line even. in it though, where he says, is it maturity or laziness? <gasps> I think. Honestly, I can't wait to read the book. I have no context, but in my very ignorant state of excitement, it's both. Yeah. Because when you're mature and you've done your work and you've gotten to the place where you can sort of look around you and see that you've created something of value for yourself, you can get lazy and it's not even lazy. Yeah. It's, it's just attention on yourself and the quiet spaces truth. So good. To put it in context, he was talking about our ability to learn though. Oh my God, really? Yeah. And he was saying often people quit learning and it's not because they've matured and figured it out. It's because they got lazy. Wow. Uh, Wow. Naveen speaks about it, how the vision narrows, you know, people get a hump on their back. Yes, and she yes. talks about how the memory overtakes the future and the potential. And if you oh think God. about like my great grandmother had Alzheimer's and my grandmother had dementia. And when people have dementia, they go to the past. And that's what <gasps> they speak about is the past. And so wow. Naveen is always saying that we have to keep our front body open and soft and our vision big so that the memory doesn't overtake the potential and it doesn't show up as a hump on the back. Mm. Good grief. Right? Wow. I think I've heard her say that, but I didn't it didn't land with me like it did just then. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. Thank you so much. It just landed with me a couple months ago and I've been talking about it a lot with my mm-hmm. silver foxes. And we do yes. a lot of supported back bends for the upper body because of that. Yes. To right, just open course. that up, open it up. Make sure it stays open. Mm-hmm. Yes. So smart. Yeah. While we're talking about silver foxes, because I don't get you for much longer, Mm. I am in love with the way that you are embracing and growing your eldership and your aging. Mm. And um, to our listener, I fully support you, whatever choices you're making about your body as you age. Um, I would love to hear from you though, Elena, about, I know you've committed to, you promised your mother no Botox. Mm, I and did. And you're letting, <laughs> you're embracing the aging process as it is. I would love to hear from you. I think it's so important for, especially our younger listeners that, 
you know, haven't even thought about these things yet about what the path that they'd like to take? Well, it is a choice and it's a very, uh, I think, conscientious, conscious choice to um, really embrace yourself as you change. So every morning I wake up, it's very early before anybody else gets up. I go into my little closet to meditate. But before I do that, tongue scraping, teeth brushing, maybe even flossing again. I love to keep my gums really bouncy. And um, rinse with uh, salt water and cinnamon and frankincense. And then I do a oil pulling session, like five to ten minutes with coconut oil that has also cinnamon, frankincense, myrrh, whatever I can find around. While I'm doing that, I use a gua sha stone. I like take the time to use a gua sha stone and actually just remind the muscles and um, tissues of my face where things are. And I touch myself very lovingly. I'm doing it right now with my little fingertips. (laughs) I touch my face really lovingly. I smile in the mirror. Like I really take the time to welcome myself to the day. I know it sounds super hokey. If you have young kids, I know you don't have the time to do this, but they will get older and this will change. (laughs) I promise. And oh, it's such a nice start to the day. I can't even say enough about it. When I'm doing that, maybe it's five or 10 minutes. I finish that little process. I uh, send the oil pulling oil down the toilet and I come to my meditation seat, which is actually right next to me where I record uh, Mm -hmm. audio podcasts. And I take my time. I bow to my seat. I take a little reading in the Daily Stoic or one of my Zen practice books or sometimes I'm reading, um, I have a little stack of books here. I'm reading also Audre Lorde's uh, essays and speeches a uh, book called Sister Outsider, and I'll sit for 20 minutes, and then a alar- little alarm goes off. I'll do some Wim Hof breathing, three rounds usually, and then I'll read a little bit more. This whole process usually takes like 45 minutes. I know it seems really decadent, but it's the, the whole process has grown, and now I relish this time. Um, And right now I'm continuing to read Asada Shakur's autobiography, which I think also should be given to every eighth grader Mm -hmm. in this country. Uh, But that's a story for another day. Mm -hmm. And that's how I take care of myself. And that, to get back to the question, is how I welcome myself into elderhood. I have a little more time because my son doesn't need me except to make lunch a few days a week and make him a little breakfast and give him a little squeeze when he leaves drives away. It's so wild. Um, (laughs) I, I am embracing myself in different ways by spending more time enriching my mind, um, smiling at myself in the mirror, you know, just welcoming myself to this time. It is Mm. such a special time. Naveen also has taught me uh, a little bit about this too, where, you know, she really revels in her time alone and she revels in her practice and, you know, there's something very special about consciously uh, welcoming yourself into this phase. Yeah. You know, feels so good. I have the exact same routine. <laughs> of course you do. Because I don't of have children. Of course you do. My little sister. <laughs> of course you do. I That's don't, great. My podcast stuff is not by my bed because I have terrible Wi-Fi at my house. So I'm actually right, right. now sitting in my dad's cabinet business. Um, nice. But I do the exact same thing. I have whatever books I'm reading. The only piece I add is I have um, Kate Northrop's Do Less Planner. And I sit down and fill out the daily sheet every day where it mm-hmm. asks me where the moon is and where my cycle is and what I want to do today and how am I feeling and my sleep. So I fill out that and I put a word of the day on that sheet. So that's the last thing I do Brilliant. before I leave. But what I don't do that you just suggested is to do my gua sha in the mirror. Oh, it's the nicest. I think that's genius to look in your own eyes and look at your face in a loving way. Yeah. And there was a period of time before I got the memo about this 
And I think I was doing some reading of, um, oh gosh, why Stephen Jenkinson, mm -hmm. which was very helpful. And before I got that memo, though, I was always looking in the mirror, like pulling on my face, going, oh my God, it's falling. Everything's falling. Everything's <laughs> falling. And instead of that whole vibe, I just go ahead and like, just gently coax all of the muscles and the tissues upward. And it, I literally feel a change in the chemistry inside of my body. Yeah. Well, movement is the language of cells. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. To quote Dr. Andrea Spina. Nice um, one. Yeah. It's uh, in the functional range conditioning system I'm trained in. It's a mobility system for joint health. Uh, yeah, yes. He says movement is... Uh, the language of cells, or I'm sorry, force is the language of cells. Movement is what you're saying. Dang. Which if you think about like, it's for our listener, if that is unclear, Wolf's law is how bones grow. It takes gravity. So your bones grow density when you put weight on them. So you mm. walk and it builds bone density. So that's force. So that's what he means by that. And then the right. movement is what you're telling the cell to do, telling the tissue to do. So like scar tissue is disorganized cells. And for example, oh my God, yes. Yeah. So, you, when you do things like scraping or lymphatic flush and stuff, you're coaxing the tissues, you're telling them what direction to grow and yes. how to produce. So, it's, there's good science behind it. And I can see a difference in half of my face when I do it in the morning. And it's such, sure. a, such a loving, sweet ritual. I got on that train because of you. Um, and the, I bought the Wildling Beauty stuff. And, I'm not sponsored. I'm not selling you anything, but it's lovely. And uh, I use it every day now. And I actually have their little cups now for when I'm breaking out. Uh, oh, that's so that great. it's less stimulating. And I love the little mini cup under my eyes. Beautiful. That's a great call, actually. Yeah. Yeah. They're all, they're all great. Wildling is great. Uh, wild Lily is great. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, no affiliates, but we love we love things. I love talking about the things that I love helping yeah. these folks. Yeah. Yeah, so they're nice. a good company. And it's just such a gift to yourself. I think that was actually, you already answered my next question, which was how do we create ritual and ceremony? Because I think I've been thinking a lot about why life becomes mundane and gray. And it's when we get in routine. And ritual is the antidote to routine. Like if you, you know, we start to, you're doing the same practice and it's no longer ritualized is when you, uh, the joy like seeps out of the practice, you know, you're like, oh, I don't want to do asana. I'm sick of that um, because it's no longer been ritualized. And right. the ceremony and the ritual brings the joy and the luminosity back in. Right. Beautiful. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. And you're so good at ritual and ceremony. You know, I don't, I don't think anyone is particularly good at it. I do think that if we prioritize it, though, like if you're listening to this and you think, oh, I'd love to have that, I don't have the time. None of us have the time, actually. Mm -hmm. But if we prioritize it, we practice, you know, moving it into the little pockets of our days. Two seconds, I pick a card. Yeah. Two seconds. It's so easy. Yes. And it really makes a huge difference. Yeah, I have really been, Elena made a beautiful deck called Daily Ceremony. And if those aren't available to you, you can always just choose a word from the dictionary or mm -hmm. a word that you love. But totally. it's I've made a little ritual every morning. That's the word that I write in my planner. I pull a card for the day. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I just take mm -hmm. it as whatever that wisdom is for that day. You know, well, this is what I need to hear today. How could I cultivate that today? Totally, totally. It's that easy. Because we don't, you know, we're not, we're not wired for directionality. Mm -mm. We're wired for chaos, <laughs> you yes. know? But if we give ourselves a little tiny hint of a direction, it can really change things. It really helps me feel better arranged and um, more creative. Yes. If I have my day laid out, I am free. I know exactly where to be and when. Yeah. And I'm free. Yes. One of my students said, your calendar work seems so <clears throat> strict and limiting. And I said, no, it's the conditions for freedom. Exactly. Yeah. Boom. 
And to quote Naveen again, you know, she speaks about how life is very disorganizing. Yes. And it's always, you know, to use Douglas Brooks' words, it's subject to entropy and decay. But it's hopeful because we get to reorganize it. Mm -hmm. And we have the capacity to organize ourselves over and over and over again and organize our bodies and set up the conditions to leverage what's happening around us and within us to our advantage again and again. And Abby just said the other day, Abby Galvin, our mutual teacher, that, you know, every single time the pianist comes to the stage, they have to play their scales. They don't start with Chopin. And so our morning ritual is us playing our scales. Oh, dude, that's beautiful. Isn't it? It is beautiful. It landed with me because I play piano. So it really landed. I was like, oh yeah, I have to play my scales every time I sit down. Same. I'm such a loser. I haven't been practicing in the I last haven't five either. days. <laughs> I have to get back in there. My lessons are starting up again next week. Wonderful. But here's what's cool for your listener. It's important to note that Naveen trained Abby and both are incredible teachers to yes. both of us. Naveen is the owner of Katona Yoga in upstate New York. Katonayoga.com. Abby is the owner of the studio dot yoga yeah they got a dot yoga domain the studio dot yoga which is in new york city yes. which is one of my home studios even though i don't live there anymore i still will teach there quarterly for um as long as i can yes both are incredible for totally some of the same and some really different reasons the and material both comes through abby differently course. and it's it so stunning it does. It totally does. I'm actually speaking to her next. As soon as we get off of this conversation, I get the pleasure of speaking with Abby next. She's the best. She's Do you have time best. to listen to the episode that I did with her? Because I got have into already it listened good. to it. Okay, good. Yes. Good. Yeah, she's so wonderful. That would be fun. It will be. I find that before I interview people, I, I do find it's nice to listen to previous interviews that they've done with people whom I respect, because I always get little facets and angles that I didn't realize were, you know, possible to talk about. Yes, it's really oh, wow. stimulating. That's why I listen to so many of, I listened to your episode with Jeff Krasno um, mm. and others as well, and his show, just to really get a sense of things and um, He's great. I listen to your podcast and uh, have the pleasure of getting to sit under your tutelage semi-regularly. Yes. So I had a good sense of, of you. But, good. Well, I know that I need to let you go. And um, mm. for our listener, everything we talked about will be in the show notes. So the mm-hmm. books that we referenced and Elena's podcast, the yoga studios, um, Elena teaches on Glow. She has live stream classes. She has a stunning podcast called Practice You. Um, I'm in her mentorship program, though I always have to watch the recordings. Um, but she has her mentorship program and about a million other offerings for you that you can find at elenabrower.com. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you much sister. for your time, Elena. This was so lovely. Thank you so much for having me. I love you. I love really you. proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of us proud of us. Word. <laughs> Word. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elena.